Those who knew Julian Harvey all described him the same way. He was a charming, handsome man who, at the ripe age of 44, was still adept at captivating a room as he had been in his 20s. Julian was interesting and cool, having worked as a sea captain for a number of years, and having served 16 years in the Air Force. He seemed to have a story for every occasion, and each of his stories seemed like something out of Indiana Jones. He was the person you wanted to have at your party, because even in a room where no one knew each other, he would bring people together. People were always around him, always keen on listening to what he had gotten up to, what new adventure he was going on, and how he was going to get out of his latest hijinks. In 1949, Harvey had survived when his speeding car crashed through a bridge in northern Florida and plunged into a canal, killing his second wife and her mother. He had been forced to parachute from airplanes twice because of engine failure. During World War II, he crash-landed a battle-damaged B-24. In 1955, Harvey and four companions were rescued by a helicopter after his yacht, Torbatross, struck the submerged wreck of the U.S. battleship of the U.S. battleship Texas in Chesapeake Bay. Three years later, his powerboat, Valiant, went down in the Gulf of Mexico, and once more, Harvey escaped with his life. Harvey was the kind of person whose life was an adventure, who had hundreds of once-in-a-lifetime stories. But on November 17, 1961, his life would come to a shocking end, and the world at large would find out who Julian Harvey really was. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today, we are going to be going over the case of the Bluebell and the incredible story of Terry Jo Duperalt's survival. This case was sent in to us by one of our longest-running patrons, and having never heard of this case before, my brother and I immediately began researching, and what we found was incredible to say the least. As always, if there is a video you would like to see on this channel, or a case you want more attention brought to, feel free to email us at dreading.official at gmail.com. We have a backlog of emails that we are currently mining through, but it's our hope to cover every viewer's suggestion. With all of that said, let us begin. Arthur Duperall was described as a humble, honest man. He was unassuming, kind, and courteous, but not someone who many people took notice of in their daily life. Arthur was the type of man to keep his head down and his nose to the grindstone, always focusing on the immediate task at hand and whatever it was he was trying to accomplish. Like Harvey, he had served his country in World War II and, while deployed, sailed from the Florida Keys to the Bahamas. Because of the war, Arthur felt nothing but anxiety while sailing, but even his fear of dying could not stop him from recognizing how beautiful the area was. After returning home, he promised himself that when he had a family of his own, and when he could afford to, he would charter his own boat and sail the same course, allowing himself to fully enjoy the cruise. When he returned home to Green Bay, Wisconsin, he met and married Jean Duperalt, and the couple went on to have three children, Brian, Terry Joe, and Renee. Arthur worked as an optometrist to provide for the family, and his income supported the family well enough. But with every paycheck, Arthur put money aside to fulfill his dream, and finally at the age of 40, they had set enough aside. Every member of the family was well aware of how much this week-long course meant to Arthur. He regularly talked about how impactful this trip was the first time he went, and how much it meant to him to bring his entire family with him on this vacation. He went further to say that if Jean and the kids enjoyed the cruise as much as he hoped they would, he would take a full sabbatical from work and stay in Florida as long as they could. The family arrived in Fort Lauderdale, Florida in early November 1961, and Arthur quickly set about finding a boat for the family to sail on. Some sources state that Duperold already knew Harvey before making the trip while others say they met on the first day. But whichever is the case, Duperalt was able to charter a 60-foot catch called the Bluebell for $515 and hired Harvey to skipper the vessel and his wife, Mary Dean, to work as a cook on board. On Wednesday, November 8th, 1961, Arthur, Jean, Brian, Terry Joe, Renee, Julian, and Mary all boarded the catch and departed from the Bahia Mar Marina. For the next four days, the family and the crew traveled to Bimini and Sandy Point and were seen by others in the area. According to witnesses, they appeared to be having a wonderful time and routinely spent time buying souvenirs and talking with others in the area about how wonderful it must be to live there. Arthur would go on to speak to multiple people about how impactful this vacation had been on him, saying it was a once-in-a-lifetime thing while nearly crying. He also reportedly stated that the family would likely be back in the area before Christmas and was overheard talking to his wife about potentially moving to Florida full-time. On November 12th, the family and the crew would once again board the Bluebell for dinner, which was chicken cacciatore, as prepared by Mary. But what happened directly after, no one knows. 
The next day, November 13th, 1961, at approximately 12.35 p.m., a man was spotted waving frantically from a lifeboat in the middle of the sea by crew members on an oil tanker. As he got closer and closer to the oil rig, he was heard shouting, Help! I've got a dead baby on board. That man was Julian Harvey. He was brought onto the rig along with the body of seven-year-old René Duperault and told the crew members of the horrific events that had taken place the day before. Shortly after dinner the night before, the bluebell had been hit by a sudden, strong squall that came out of nowhere. This sudden wind hit the bluebell hard and caused the entire ship to keel over, which in turn caused the main mast to snap in two. Mary and Arthur had been slightly injured by the mast breaking, but not badly. But the mast had pierced through the deck, which prevented Harvey from reaching anyone else on the boat. The damage didn't stop there as a fire broke out on the other side of the boat, leaving Mary, Arthur, and the rest of the Duperault family on a sinking ship ablaze in the middle of the ocean. Harry tried to get the others on board to abandon ship, and he released the life raft to try and save them, but he was unable to recover anyone besides seven-year-old Rene, who had already drowned. Harvey was quickly taken back to shore and questioned by authorities, who found his story to be unbelievable. He had worked in the Air Force, survived multiple near-death situations, and was a skilled skipper. So the concept that an entire boat filled with people, saved for him, had gone down seemed entirely unbelievable. An autopsy was done on Renee, which showed she had drowned, like Harvey had claimed. And with no evidence to say he was lying, he was eventually allowed to return to Miami, with the caveat that he would speak to the U.S. Coast Guard upon his return. The day after Harvey returned to Miami, Florida, a shocking discovery would be made at sea. The second officer, Nikolas Spakadakis, on the Greek freighter Captain Theo, who would spot a child sitting upright on a small cork board in the middle of the ocean. He immediately raised the alarm, telling his captain what he saw, and upon looking once more, they both saw a small, oblong white raft carrying a young blonde-haired child leaning backward and waving feebly, surrounded by sharks. The captain quickly stopped the boat and ordered a life raft be sent out to save the young girl, who had clearly been out on open water for days. The child was sunburnt, dehydrated, and completely incoherent. She seemed aware that she had been saved, but her body was stiff, having been sat upright on the small cork board for days, unable to lay down or move, lest the board break. She was given water and orange juice as salt was sponged from her body with wet towels and Vaseline applied to her lips. After drinking some water, she was able to identify herself as Terry Jo Duperalt, the 11-year-old daughter of Arthur and Jean. But before she could state what had happened to her, her body fully gave out, leaving her in a semi-comatose state. Captain Stylionis Kutsidontis immediately informed the United States Coast Guard of the rescue and requested a rescue helicopter be sent immediately, as they weren't able to provide the child with adequate care. That same day, she would be airlifted off of the Captain Theo and placed in intensive care. At the same time, Harvey was reiterating his version of events to the U.S. Coast Guard, telling them that there was nothing he could have done to save his wife and the family who had hired him. After talking for a few hours, they would agree to meet back up the next day, just to go over more details and verify his story. They too felt that there was something wrong with his version of events, but told him otherwise, saying that they just needed to follow procedure. Harvey didn't seem to notice their suspicion, and would return to be interviewed the next day. On November 17th, in the midst of his interview, the Coast Guard would tell him that they miraculously were able to locate Terry Joe Duperalt. They informed the skipper that she'd been found lost at sea on a small cork board that had disintegrated after she was found. According to those present, Harvey went white and quickly asked if she survived. He was told that she had, and was currently in critical condition, and was expected to make a full recovery. In response, Harvey stammered, Oh my god, why, that's wonderful, before excusing himself and ending the interview. He told the Coast Guard that he was tired, and needed to speak with his deceased wife's family, but it was clear that something was really wrong. After hearing that there had been a survivor to the shipwreck, someone who likely could confirm his story, Harvey seemed terrified, not overjoyed and there was a good reason. A few short hours later, Harvey would check into the Sandman Hotel under the name John Monroe. Whilst there, he penned a two-page letter addressed to a close friend from the military. The letter read, I got too tired and nervous. I couldn't stand it any longer. Following his letter, he killed himself in the hotel room. It was only after his body was discovered that the true nature of Julian Harvey was shared. On November 20th, three days after Julian had killed himself, Terry Joe had recovered enough to tell her story. According to Terry, 
After she finished her dinner, she had retired to a lower cabin in the ship to go to sleep for the night around 9 o'clock. Everyone was still talking and having a good time on deck, but she was exhausted and wanted to get some rest for the day ahead. However, she was later woken up by the sound of her brother screaming and calling out for her father's help, followed by loud booming footsteps over the cabin. She was scared but worried about what was going on, so she left her cabin to see what was happening on the main deck. When she entered the main cabin of the ship, she was greeted by the sight of her mother and her brother's dead bodies, although she couldn't say for certain how they died. Scared but wanting to find her other family members, she continued about the ship until she saw Harvey carrying a bucket of oil and water. He hit her, then pushed her below deck, screaming that she needed to stay down in her cabin before storming off. Scared and hurt, Terry ran to her cabin, hoping that her father would come to her rescue or that she was having a nightmare. But minutes later, a mixture of oil and water came flooding through her cabin door. Harvey then entered the room carrying a large rifle. He pointed the gun at her, but didn't shoot, and the two stared at each other for a short amount of time before he left. Terry Joe would hear the gun go off outside of her room, and it's likely that he shot the bodies of her family members. Once again, Terry Joe would leave her room and run onto the main deck of the boat, which had already begun to sink. Harvey was standing on the port side of the deck, next to the life raft. Upon seeing the 11-year-old, Harvey asked her if the life raft was loose, to which she replied that she didn't know. Harvey instructed her how to loosen the raft, and left the child for a short amount of time, returning carrying what is now suspected to be her younger sister's dead body. The life raft was left in the water, slowly floating away from the boat, and without saying a word to the child, Harvey dove overboard, getting into the raft and pushing it away from the sinking ship. Now left alone on the boat with the bodies of her family and Julian's wife, Terry panicked. She quickly found a small cork board on the deck and threw it overboard before the ship sank and was able to grab a hold of it. The board was small and only allowed for her to sit perfectly upright at all times, lest it break apart and leave her adrift. For three full days, she floated along without food or water and believing that she would die at sea. As to why Julian killed his wife and her family, Terry Joe had no idea. All she knew was it was a miracle that she was alive. It was only after Terry Joe's statement and Julian Harvey's death that Julian's real character would be revealed. His life had been full of adventure and intrigue, but it wasn't because adventure followed him. Rather, he had caused most of his life's most dangerous moments. His last wife, Mary, who died on the Bluebell, had been his sixth wife. All of his surviving ex-wives described Julian the same way. He was vain, difficult, and a horrendous life partner. Their love stories had all been brief, meeting at a bar or an event where Julian would sweep them off their feet, marrying them weeks or months later. But after the wedding, the love quickly dissipated. His marriages were filled with infidelity, with him often sleeping with other women just to show that he could. He would become resentful of his wives and their want for companionship, and he'd critique their bodies, claiming that they weren't worthy of him. Upon Terry Joe stating that Harvey had attempted to kill her entire family and sink the ship, they began looking into the drowning death of his second wife and mother-in-law. According to Harvey's history, in 1946, Harvey had been driving his wife and her mother when the car drove off of a bridge into a lake. He'd been able to get out of the wreckage unscathed, but his wife and her mother drowned. Experts found the drowning made no sense, because he had been in the car when it went off the bridge. As he claimed to be, he would have been able to help the two women reach safety. They concluded that either Harvey was not in the car when it went into the water, or he had deliberately let his wife and mother-in-law drown. Similarly, the investigation looked into multiple shipwrecks he had been a part of since his time in the military, and found that Harvey had purposely wrecked the Torbatas and the Valiant, sinking the boats to get the insurance money. Despite the general public's perception of Julian as a handsome explorer who was always up for adventure, the reality was much bleaker. He was a vain egomaniac who couldn't hold down a job and was struggling with a significant amount of debt. Four months before the final sealing of the Bluebell, Harvey would get married for the final time, and immediately after, take out a $20,000 double indemnity life insurance policy on his wife, which would double should she die in an accident. From Terry Joe's statement, in Julian's own history, the investigation concluded, with them announcing that Julian had always planned to kill his wife on the cruise, and only killed the Duperalts to make the sinking of the ship look more believable. Had Terry Joe perished alongside her family, no one would have ever known about what happened that night, and Julian Harvey would have likely killed again. Terry Joe would go on to live with her grandmother and three cousins, and would never publicly speak about what had happened to her that night. That is, until 2010, when she released her book, Alone, Orphan at Sea. If you've made it to this portion in the video, thank you for watching. As always, if there is a story you would like to see on this channel, 
or a case you want more attention brought to, feel free to email me at dreading.official at gmail.com. With all of that said, have a great day, and remember to stay safe.